You, I got to tell you a little funny real quick. You, you want a funny? So you guys were not in the first service, obviously, most of you, and we had a complete blackout right when I started. So I've changed my pants and we're ready to go. Well, happy Labor Day. In case that does happen, just wants to let you know, we'll reboot again. But uh, yeah, we got through that. Everything went out. Everything was done. But hey, it's Labor Day. It can happen, right? So thank you for on a Labor Day weekend, um, choosing to come and hang out here at church, at Capital City Church. We're glad that you did that. Uh, Rick and Joy are taking just some time away. You know how couples do that? You know, you seem to always have families or kids or grandkids, but they're just going to take some time away. And I said, Rick and Joy, you do your thing. And Lori and I and the crew will do it. So we're here. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever flown? Flown a plane? Okay. When you fly a typical airlines, you fly a Delta American, then you get a ticket. And on that ticket, it has what? Row seat. Row seat. See, everybody knows that. I've flown for decades. I've flown all over the country. I've flown internationally. You buy a ticket, you get a row and a seat. And when you're Abby Normal like some of us, you, want, you, you have to have a seat. I don't fit in seats. My knees hit the um, thing that comes down, right? I never get to put water on anything. My knees are in the way. So I've got to have a row and a seat that I can fit or I might lose my mind and you would watch me on the news. It's that bad. So what are the best seats on a plane? Bookhead, the extra room right towards the front of most of the bigger planes, right? Everybody knows the exit row because nothing's ever going to happen to the plane. You just need some extra leg room. And in worst case scenario, if everything's taken up and you don't want to pay extra money for the exit row now, that's prejudice against tall people, by the way. Um, aisle seat, right? At least an aisle seat so I can stick my bad knee out or, you know, sit sort of cockeyed so you can spread your legs. Well, Lori says, hey, we're going down to Kansas City. We're seeing some family and we're flying out from there. She's from Kansas City and she says, hey, let's fly Southwest. We'll save money. I'm like, great. And of all of my flight experience, I could have sworn I've flown Southwest before. So I'm saying, okay, I got it. It says section C. She's like, that's not gonna be good enough. I'm like, but what does that mean? Again, a ticket has a row and a seat. In my head, row and seat. She's like, no, we need see, we, see, we need something better. I'm like, is that first class? Like, what is Southwest? Is this something, I mean, I always thought they were cheaper flights. So cheap means there's usually first class, right? She goes, no, we need something better. So I get online, pay a little extra dollar, and we get an A, 10 to 11. I'm like, A, okay, is this row or seat? She's like, no, no, just trust me. We'll just get there, and you'll find out. And in my head, you know, I'm a preparer. I'm like, this doesn't compute. So we get to the airlines, and literally, if you've not flown Southwest Airlines, there is a pole and a sign that says A, one through five. About five feet. So you're congregating around. Now it says a pole. A, 6 through 11. And then B and C. C, we would have been back in nosebleed section. And I'm still trying to figure out row and seat. I need some leg room. And then you're, you're probably with me, right? So you congregate around this thing. You congregate around this A, 6 through whatever. And because most people are not, they don't, like um, deal with conflict. So they're just pretty quiet. So very rarely does anybody say, what's your seat? You know, A whatever, or whatever your position is. A, well, we're 10, 11. We're supposed to be back towards the back, but I'm figuring things, I'm slow, but I'm figuring things out. I'm like, so this airlines thinks that people are courteous and kind and others focused. And you know what I'm doing? The same thing you would do. I'm sizing everybody up. I'm like, that old man with the cane, he's out first. It's a free-for-all, right? I mean, you go as a group. Those two uh, were, I said, baby, just follow me. We got this, right? Because I need the seat. I got to confess that because it was a little bit weird. And when I got in the plane, I learned something that most people aren't abnormal like some of us. And they like closer to the plane. So we got an exit row with leg room. But in full confession, I was a little bit selfish. I was focused on me. I didn't really care about anybody in B or C. I was actually trying to figure out, okay, we can, nobody's asking any questions about where we are in the A, six through 11. So let's just scoot up and let's be watching. So 
The reason I illustrate that is we all have a propensity to be selfish. We all do. We're naturally selfish people. You come out of the room screaming and crying because you want what you want. Well, Paul has had this situation with the church at Philippi. And a guy on Southwest Airlines must be a part of their church because he's really self-focused. He's looking at his agenda. He's not, or maybe they, didn't say specific names, but maybe they are forgetting about others' needs and others' perspectives. So Philippians 2 starts off this way. I want to walk us through this. It says this, to the church at Philippi. These are supposedly Christians and church followers, right? So this is not just going off to anybody. This is specifically to the church at Philippi. The apostle Paul is writing this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Not all the time, at least for me. Then make me truly happy, agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Do nothing. Can we change that word? How about most of the time? Nothing is such a strong word. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Well, I got to tell you, um, I'm going to walk through something because, you know, Pastor Rick and I like to not just disseminate information. We want it to, to land. So I got this little thing, if you'll follow along. So the first little connect point is this. It's more of he, meaning Jesus, right? And just hang on. We'll, I'll walk you through this. More of he, meaning more of Jesus. So when Paul says this, he's, he's sort of dealing with, um, again, the church and he realizes there's a lack of harmony, a lack of peace going on. And so he starts with, hey, um, first question, is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ? Now, remember, these are mainly Jewish people that knew some of the customs. Don't forget, they had to go before a priest. They had to adhere to 615 laws, thanks to some of the Mosaic laws, some of the Pharisees putting stuff in there. It was a big deal to be a follower of Jehovah. And Paul's like, have you forgotten? <laughs> These are really rhetorical questions, right? Is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ? Yes, because of Jesus now, we go directly before the throne. We get a personal relationship. We don't depend on anybody or anything. Um, any comfort from his love, they were reciprocal. The problem was they forgot their first love, which is why I just sort of titled that and more of he. Once we get away from the basics, we start to drift a little bit. And Paul, because he is uh, led by the spirit, gets a, a concept that those of us who lead or coach uh, understand this. He's describing, starting off with a group dynamic, right? He <clears throat> realizes there's some things going on. He's reminding us where we need to start from, but there's a group dynamic. And here's what Paul knows. Group dynamics are really people dynamics. They're individuals. It's like saying I need marriage counseling or marriage coaching. There's nothing technical about marriage. It's that you need individual help to get better with your communication, with your how to resolve conflict. And in that, your marriage gets to be more healthy, right? So this is a group problem that Paul is about to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. let's get down to the nitty gritty and let's take it from um, a group dynamic to a very personal dynamic. So more of he, the second part we're going to camp out here a little bit is, well, it's the kind that steps on our toes a little bit, to be honest with you. It's less of me. So more of he, like Jesus, less of me. Again, here's that doggone word again. Do most things without selfish ambition or vain conceit, even percentage-wise. What if we just said 70%? Wouldn't that be a little easier? But listen, Paul says, because he's given us an example of Jesus, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Like, I don't know, somebody who gets online at Southwest Airlines and is looking at his thing, right? Because selfishness is a choice. If I'm not careful, I, uh, selfishness just creeps in all the time. And you say, I don't, maybe, yeah, maybe no, but it does. So for instance, if you did something really incredible last week, right? And you helped a little old lady cross the street, you changed the tire, you gave money to somebody, right? The typical kind of things, you're like, pat yourself on the back. And what do you do next? You're like, hey, let me share a few things. Hey, this is what I did. Before you know it, you're posting something. 
you know that's pride now, right? So you've gone from serving and being helpful and loving to now making sure everybody knows that you've patted yourself in the back. So selfishness, that pride, it creeps in and Paul knew that. So he's warning us, listen, when it becomes a lack of peace and harmony, there's a reason for that. And it's not a group problem. It's an individual problem. So we have to stop and start to walk through some of these things. So selfish ambition, a definition here is motivation to elevate oneself or to put one's own interest above another. It's motives. So why is, why are motives important? When I, uh, when I give conversation or counsel to Rick, to Pastor Brandon, we talk to Pastor Jared, to Joy, to any of the staff, uh, Lori and I, we consult or coach with our businesses. I honestly, and you honestly have to ask yourself, why am I giving this insight? Why am I giving this input? Why do I want to assemble this team? Is it for me? Is it to push my agenda across because I think I know better? Is it because I know if we do this and I put these people together, we'll hit our goals so I get the bonus? Like there's a, you see where selfishness creeps in. So I've got to be aware, let's be honest, of my motives, not your motives, my motives. And then sometimes we do things, again, I'm the same way. Sometimes we do things with a string attached. Hey, I'm doing this. I'm loaning you 20 bucks, but don't forget, you owe me lunch. It's not how this works. Um, I'm doing this, but you know, I'm, I'm acting as if it's really a, a noble thing to do, but really it's part of my agenda I want accomplished. So here's what we know, again, that steps in our toes a little bit. Jesus models it this way. In Luke, he says this, and we're not even talking to your friends. We're talking your enemies, those mean people that sometimes we talk about or come home and have a little dinner with their name attached to it. But love your enemies, do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Any strings attached there. Any motive that could pretend to be anything other than pure. And this is not even your friends. Of course, this is supposed to happen to your friends. This is your enemy. And then why is that? Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the most high because that's how God, giving an example through his son, Jesus Christ, demonstrated it. So much so that because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, Jesus and Paul, Paul both in two different ways say, hey, who can't love those who are nice to them? Duh. Duh. We as followers of Jesus are supposed to love those who we would call an enemy. And when they want something and we have an opportunity to meet that need, listen guys, there's no strings attached. If there are, my question is time out. You've got to check your motives. The next thing Paul talked about is not only the selfish ambition, that vain conceit. That sounds like a very churchy, like, you know, sit in English kind of term there. So here's a definition of vain conceit. Self-esteem that has no foundation in reality. That's pretty cool. Self-esteem that has no foundation in reality. It also is incorrect sense of self. In Romans 12, 3, which is not a leadership principle, it's a biblical principle, Paul says this, and it, we didn't have enough time to put everything on the screen. So if you have a Capital City Church app under sermon notes, this stuff is in there and more. It says this in Romans 12, 3. Do, don't think you are better than you really are. Makes sense. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. It's not a leadership principle. It's a biblical principle. So what does an honest evaluation look like? Let's be honest with ourselves. Once again, the temptation right now is to say this. And so I just want to warn you. It's like, hey, honey, are you listening to this sermon? Right? Hey, I hope my kids are listening. Hey, I hope somebody online is listening to this. No, no, let's focus on, on me and you, okay? No, nobody else. Those are the only people that we can control and make better. So being aware of our propensities, if you will, is an honest evaluation of ourselves. Yes, to know our strengths and weaknesses are true. But with Paul and this lack of unity, we all have grown up in a broken world and we have propensities. So propensity is an inclination or natural tendency to behave in a particular way. What do I mean by that? 
see if any of these things that may creep in, again, selfishness will always creep in. Um, do you wrestle with insecurity? Sometimes with pride, with jealousy. Anybody have wrestle with, not a little really show of hands, we don't want to confess our sins for everybody, comparison? I mean, business-wise, position-wise, like, you know, you, maybe not out loud, but in your head, you wrestle with that kind of stuff. That's what I'm talking about. These are propensities. And if we're to be followers of Jesus, we have to realize that happens. A victim attitude. We had, we had a, one of our clients we talked to, <clears throat> she is now uh, retired, but she said this and it makes sense. Like this is, it's not a bad thing. What I'm getting at is it's a reality. A propensity is a reality. The vain conceit is being aware of who we are. It's not a correct uh, view of ourselves. So all of us, because we have tendencies, and she described it this way, she goes, I have a problem with trusting people. Okay, that, that happens. But here's the definition. When I was 13, I'm praying for God not to take my mother from cancer. And my mother died. It's like, I, I get it. She said, but now no, that circumstance allowed me it's part of how I came to know Jesus because even in my, in my age, I know, here's the key word, I know my propensity. I have to be careful, a lack of trust of God or of people. Like that is what I'm talking about. All of us have a propensity. And so we've got to be aware of what those propensities are like and how they might manifest themselves. I had another lady um, because in this uh, verse here in Romans 12, when it says, be honest in the evaluation of yourself, it also says this, it, um, it means too high or too low, right? And in this day and time, and it's really been ongoing, but especially post-COVID, there's a lot of people who look at themselves and the, their evaluation of themselves is very low. So I'm talking to a, a, a client and uh, she works at a financial institution. She was there the year after it started. Been there 20 plus years. We're having our one-on-one. It's just her and I. We're talking through things, walking through some of her homework assignment. And I asked this question. I said, listen, you've been here for 20 plus years. You're here a year after the business started. You've seen things come and go. You've seen changes being made. So like when you have a team meeting, like what kind of, what kind of help do you give them? And her posture just slunk over. Her response was just, tears running down her face. She said to me, Dan, I don't think I have much of anything to offer of value. That, my friends, is also an inappropriate or wrong view of yourself. It's a lie from the pit of hell because my God has made everything great. Either we believe a lie because somebody has said something, we've walked through something, and our perception is we're either junk or maybe we're middle class, but that's not true. God makes everything great. The problem is lies creep in. Selfishness creeps in. Sometimes it's self-afflicted. Sometimes other people have done this. Paul knows this. And the first point is to say, whoa, whoa, if you're a follower of Jesus, don't forget that's where we start. More of he. And then because Paul knows this, he says, less of me because the selfishness creeps in, just like Southwest Airlines, it happens. Now we're gonna talk about two more points, but I'm gonna pray for us. We're gonna sing a few songs and let's just wrestle and think about some of these principles and we'll tie it up here in just a few minutes. Let me pray for you. So more of me, or more of me, how about that for a faux pas? <laughs> See what I just said? Do the opposite of that. So uh, more of he, how about that? Less of me. And now I want to talk about the, the third principle here is you before me. See, I'm simple phrases. Maybe this stuff will stick. So you before me. He goes on to say in Philippians, the sort of the B we call it of the verse three, in humility, which is the opposite of self-ambition, vain conceit, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now that's a nice thought. It's a popular phrase, right? Just being diverse and looking for others, inclusivity. But this is not, again, a, a popular phrase, a leadership phrase. It's a biblical mandate. 
And it's the opposite, so it helps me keep focus others, right? If um, you have the, some of the anger problems, and anger is really something that's been done to you, depression is the same thing, focus on you. How do you get out of that? Others. You put the focus on others, you do for others, you think of others, and it takes you out of that slump, trying to think of others from their perspective. So this is not just a phrase, and it's not something I have to do. I don't always do this well, as I illustrated by the Southwest Airlines, but my desire is that I wake up and think about what Lori, my wife, needs, my kids and daughters-in-law needs, my grandkids, my Cap City family, my community, my neighbors, whoever God puts before me, God help renew my mind so I'm others focused. And I want, I want these two principles when I wake up every morning to be on my mind and on my lips. I want to be prepared to give, not to take. I want to be prepared to invest in others, not use others. And if you've ever been in leadership and, man, those pressures come and you've got to perform, you've got to hit the deadlines, you've got to have the wins, man, you will use people. It's a matter of time because you know why? Selfishness creeps in. Even when I mean well, it creeps in. So generally, I want, I desire to wake up seeing how people, or God puts people before my path so I can give and invest in them, not take or use them. Does that make sense? I want to illustrate a very personal story that I you know, it's personal because it's personal, but it's personal because it involves uh, Pastor Rick. Uh, some of you guys know this. I've used this phrase as humor, but it's true. Uh, Rick and I have known each other since eighth grade, and Rick's, Rick's way older than I am. He's like a year older than I am, grade-wise. So in eighth grade, we were chasing girls before we chased God. It's true. And Rick's not here, but I got to tell you the truth. It was all Rick's idea. Me, I wanted to pray and read the Bible. Rick wanted to chase the Pacello twins. I'm just saying um, and I would say in the last 15 years, we have gotten really close. And I don't mean churchy close. I mean like life in both of our arenas had seen hard, hurtful, deep, dark times. And you and I know in relationships, that's when you really go deep. Churchy word is accountability partners. I just call it simply living life together because the, this is not the church. This is the church. Relationship is what Jesus came to start, not a building. Don't forget, that's a big differentiation. So Rick and I, as leaders and pastors, like we're, we're doing life together because life, as you know, is not always perfect. And I know all about, even before it was a thing, I know all about Cap City Church before Rick got here over, I think it's seven years ago, seven or eight. Remember, seven? I should know that. I think it's seven. So I was in prayer with him. We're talking back and forth. He comes up here, visits, and then, of course, he becomes the senior pastor of Capital City Church, and I'm aware of walking in all through him, praying with him, exciting, and see God moving in some really cool ways. Lori and I came over within the first year or two just to be an encouragement to him to see the church. And he says something sort of goofy, like, you know, you guys should come over and help, help us build a church. And I'm like, dude, I know a lot about you, and you know a lot about me. We're both strong leaders. I'm not, I, you know, we know the stories. I'm not sure that's going to work out, but, you know, it's maybe it's just a nice thing. We, so we go on for, for several years. And, um, you know, not, not only do we know each other, Lori and I have worked in churches, and we've had some, maybe like some of you, we've had some bad church experiences. And we're, you're the executive pastor, which is the number two administrator of everything over the senior pastor, who's your boss. When he makes a moral, stupid decision... Or if he has some absolute um, deep, dark character issues, or in another case, the wife who wants to take over the church, it's not a good day. My compensation comes from them. Our life is there. And as executive pastor, you don't move. I mean, they don't move. You, you, you leave. Like, that's a biblical principle. It's a David Saul kind of thing that God handles it anointed. You just walk away and God will be God and take care of it. So part of that, Rick knows. I'm like, dude, I had been... Lord and I have been messed up, but we're not doing church. We've had bad church experiences. So what we're going to do is we're going to start our own business. We're going to coach and consult, and we'll go around the country encouraging churches and leaders. 
Sounds like a perfect plan. Until one day you're in the back porch about potentially to buy a book of business and start in your direction that you feel like this is not an evil, selfish thing. We're going to do this for God's glory. And then because of some crazy situations that I don't have time to get into, God started working and doing some crazy things. And Rick sends me a text as I'm on the back porch, Lori and I both. And it's so weird about here's what's going on. You know, give me a call. And it was so weird. I'm showing Lori Rick's text while we're on the back porch of someone else's house. And when I call him up, you know, we have this conversation. It is crazy. It's, it's either God's doing some work or Rick's lost his mind. I'm not sure what at that point in time was going on. But as we start to talk and Rick says again, we believe you need to come help us, you know, help us build a church. I'm like, Rick, again, we know each other. We're close. I know your garbage. You know my garbage. Like we're both strong leaders. And sometimes these two leaders get together and their friendship dissolves over this stuff. Dude, I'm not going to do that. And this is, in our conversation, this is Rick's response to me. Dan, I care more about your success than I do my own. And I want more for you than I do from you. I care more about your success than my own. And I want more for you than from you. I'm not saying come over here and, and, and you do what you do. You know, that, that response and I knew, because I know Rick well enough, like, I knew he meant it a thousand percent. And like, that's the definition of you before me. And, and Rick has reiterated that through time and time again. I pray I've done the same for him. But that is what I mean if you're a follower of Jesus. You before me is not an option. And if it is an option, you don't understand what both the Apostle Paul is trying to help the church at Philippi and us to do. And Jesus giving us an incredible example. Um, let's end it with this because I, I love this. But so, you know, simple me here. Um, you have more of he, less of me, you before me, so I can be like Jesus. So Paul is giving all these little examples, right? But it's really everything Jesus has already modeled for us. And in the last part of, of this uh, Philippians 2, it says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, that's really the mic drop moment. Well, what's the mindset of Jesus? Well, we're going to dig into what he's been describing that the whole entire time. Group dynamics, people dynamics, let's go through a checklist. But this is what he means. This is like the example. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God. Something to be used to his own advantage. Um, Jesus could have controlled, manipulated, intimidated, and used his power to make us squirm like a worm. He could have done many things that you and I, if we had those powers in some of the situations we've been in, we would have used the power. You remember those, that teacher that did that or said that, that boss, that supervisor, that situation that if you had a little zap or zing, you had all that kind of authority and power, like a Marvel superhero, like you would write some wrongs. Don't sit there like you wouldn't. You would. You would right some wrongs. And there's really, really bad situations, right? There's the sex trafficking. Why didn't you just eliminate these people? Just zap them, poof, just be gone. I mean, there's things that if we had Jesus' power, we would leverage it. And the world tells us leverage and use what you have to your advantage. It's all over the place. Because you're supposed to look out for number one, right? But I got to tell you, Jesus did something as I was studying this. I just couldn't not see it. And I want you to see it. So we're just going to pause right there in that Philippians 2 verse. And I want you to see this in Matthew 26, because it's a perfect illustration. Jesus replied, this is set up the context. This is Gethsemane. His disciples are there. The Roman soldiers are coming. Judas is betraying Jesus. It's happening right now. So that's the background to this passage in Matthew. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend, meaning Judas. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, which we know as Peter from the Gospels, reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put a pause in that. Why didn't he go after the big bad Roman soldier? Why the choir boy? Just say it. Seems a little odd to me. That's not funny? I thought it was funny. All right. So we'll talk about that in a sermon a different time. So going back, because everybody who draws a sword 
will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? A Roman legion was 6,000 people. I don't know the new math, but the old math says that's 72,000 angels. Jesus is not saying to Peter, dude, put the sword down. I can get out of this. In Isaiah, one angel killed 180,000 men. What Jesus is saying to Peter is, dude, have you not watched? You've been around me for three years. You've seen the miracles. You've walked beside me. We've had these kind of conversations. You think drawing a sword is going to get me out of this? You think that's your leverage point, the tool you can use to get me out of this? Peter, I could annihilate the human race. It's not to get out of Gethsemane. It's, you don't understand the power I have at my disposal. If you're a follower of Jesus, that should cling a little bit. So when this scripture in Philippians says that Jesus did not think equality, the power, all the things that he could do. He did not leverage it to his own advantage. He did the exact opposite. The rest of Philippians says this, the rest of that chapter says, rather he made himself nothing by taking, talk about Jesus, the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming, excuse me, obedient to death, even death on the cross. So what's the takeaway in this last point? Everybody says leverage what you have. Use what you have so you can get your agenda across, so you get the bonus, so you can get the position and title. So today my prayer is that you get what Paul is trying to communicate to the church at Philippi that we struggle with. Selfishness creeps in the whole time. And not only are we not supposed to leverage, we're supposed to use and leverage anything that you have, that I have, that I have skill and ability to, that I have a power, a position. I say this to every person who gets this VP job or executive VP job or CEO. I said, you know what's great when you get that title? You get to impact more people. It's not power and control. Because the way Jesus modeled it, which is leadership principle, it's not a leadership principle, it's a biblical principle that when you have things that God has given you, you use them to love and serve people. That, my friends, is transformational. That is what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago that has brought salvation but has changed the world and has not stopped. Why? Because this plan works. So my prayer for me, obviously, especially if I fly Southwest Airlines again, and for you is that we take this Philippians 2 passage to heart. And here's why. You know this. Selfishness creeps in like crazy. It creeps into our marriages. It creeps into our companies. It creeps into our relationships. It creeps into our churches. And that selfishness that creeps in splits those relationships more times than I have seen in a long time. It's an epidemic right now. And again, that's not a group conversation. It's an individual conversation. It starts with me. I have to walk through this checklist. Have I gotten away from being more like him? Am I, is, is less of me starting to become more of me? Is you before me really, I'm spinning that around. I'm using you to give to me so I can be like who? No. Jesus's way works. So much so that if you fully live it out, not compartmentalize your life, you will see God use you to impact people and from a business and productivity. You do not have to compromise. The world says you do. Jesus says absolutely not. And if you choose this life to live a follower of Jesus, things dramatically change. It's the greatest thing to have fruitfulness and fulfillment. Let me pray for us and just ask God to maybe quiet our hearts as we sing this last song, maybe to
do business with God. You know, prayer is nothing more than talking to God. But there's some deep stuff, there's personal stuff today, and I'm just going to pray for us that um, there's just freedom. That we take away any mask, any things we're trying to protect, any fear, any insecurity. And as a follower of Jesus, we know the Holy Spirit does both things. He both convicts us and he encourages in us. And that's my prayers. I pray for us right now. God, I thank you for these words. They're personal for me. And I know that they're personal to, to those here, those listening online. And my prayer is it's not just been a nice day or a nice topic to teach on, but Lord, that we are doing business with you. Like we're listening as a loving heavenly father would put his hand on our shoulder and point out areas of our life that we need to give up or areas that we need to, things that we need to stop or even things we need to start doing, like being here, um, making church a priority, making relationships a priority. Lord, whatever that is, may you have your will and way in our lives. May we just be open to that so we can become more like you, our, our hero, uh, not just a good guy, but the savior of the world, Lord of our life. And I pray you do that individually. I pray you do that collectively in our church here at Capital City. I pray you do that even beyond for those listening online and the groups and organizations and neighborhoods, communities that they're involved with because it does radically change things. When we not only surrender to you, but we follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we'll give you thanks for how you do that in Jesus' name. Amen.